Good evening, everyone, and welcome officially to Generally Speaking with Stephanie Butnick and Ben Cohen. I should say that this is probably the second most interesting event on American television tonight, <laughs> or maybe the first. Um, and thank you all for tuning in before the presidential debate. I'm Ari Goldstein at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York, and it's my pleasure to introduce the fourth installment of our series, Generally Speaking, with host Stephanie Butnick, who is the deputy editor at Tablet Magazine and co-host of the leading Jewish podcast, Unorthodox. The intention of this series is to shed light on an aspect of Holocaust memory that is often overlooked, but increasingly important as time goes on. And that's the experiences of three Gs or third generation Holocaust survivors, whom there are many in the United States. We are here this evening to explore in all of its complex dimensions, the experiences of growing up as the grandchild of a survivor with that kind of powerful legacy in your family. With us to share his personal experience is Ben Cohen, a filmmaker based in Brooklyn, New York. Ben's grandmother, Judy Mizell, is a Holocaust survivor with an amazing story, including testifying in a trial of a former Nazi concentration camp guard, which you will hear all about uh, this evening, including how Ben's story intersects with his grandmother's story. Before we get started, just a quick note that we do have time for audience Q&A, so please feel free to share your questions, comments, or reactions to the conversation in the Zoom chat at any point during the program. Without further ado, welcome Stephanie and Ben. Hi, thank you. Um, I think tonight will be as contentious as the debate later. So this will just like be a pregame for everyone. Um, just kidding, this will be very civilized. I wanted to thank Ari and the Museum of Jewish Heritage for the honor of hosting this series. This is our fourth event and each of them have been really fascinating conversations about different facets of the experiences and identity of the so-called third generation, the, the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Um, I'm delighted to be here with Ben Cohen tonight, and I will admit this is very confusing for me because I am married to a Ben Cohen. He's actually making my dinner right now in the other room. Um, so Ben, I will try not to like accidentally yell at you or like ask you to feed the cat or scoop the litter while we're doing this, um, but I cannot make any promises. And for everyone um, who's here tonight, you are in luck because Ben is a filmmaker and that means he knows how to do things like like share videos on Zoom and like make uh, photos pop up while he's talking, which I have no idea how to do. Um, but he, uh, throughout the night, as he's answering questions, he will be sort of showing you different photos um, and at one point or two playing a video. So you're, you're in for a very multimedia treat tonight. Um, we'll see and, if it all behaves. <laughs> what? We'll see if the technology behaves tonight. Look, you know what, it's fine. We'll, we'll go from there. Um, so Ben and I, the way this works is we're gonna chat for a bit and then we'll take all of your questions and you're free to um, chat in the chat box. Again, telling us where you're from, which I love. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of Ben Cohen fans here tonight. We have your aunt. Uh, we have, we, it, identify yourselves as a member of Ben's family. Um, I do have, I'm, I have, my grandfather is here tonight and it's his 89th birthday today. Um, and so happy birthday, Grandpa Al. I'm glad you're spending your, your birthday uh, with us in this Zoom. I hope we will keep you entertained. But so basically, um, oh wow, Ben, your wife is here. <laughs> so, okay, so don't don't mess she's up. Here too. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's there too. So so the way to ask questions, um, you could type them in the chat. The better way is to type them in the Q and A box, which you can see at the bottom menu on your Zoom. Um, and and that's it. So so, Ben, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so I, I want. Oh, by the way, Jews and Zoom do not work. Um, I feel like we will be interrupting each other all night. The lag will be terrible, but everyone will will be better for it. Um, some people are saying it's hard to hear you. Can you increase your volume? Let me see what I can do about that. This is. Oh, I love is that any better? Yes, this is great. Um, this is. I mean, in person, someone would just yell that they can't hear you. <laughs> on, talk loud. I can just talk louder. Um, yeah, that's great. So, um, so Ben, I like to start all of these events off with the same pretty fundamental question, which is, when did you first realize that, that your family, that your grandparents were, were not exactly like everyone else's uh, family? Yeah, well, um, again, thanks for having me. But so the, the first time that I uh, learned about my grandmother, Judy, being a quote unquote survivor, um, I was about nine or 10 years old. I'm sure that it was talked about in front of me before then, but the vivid memory I have um, and how I really learned her story was, be, was a really unique thing. Um, in uh, 1994, um, she had been outspoken about her story 
uh, her whole life. She had been involved in the civil rights movement and had been telling her story as a warning against racism and bigotry um, for before I was born. Um, but when I was nine or 10 years old, um, she was uh, invited to return to Stutthof concentration camp, um, which is where she and her sister and her mother were imprisoned during the war. Um, and I was, I remember my family and I were on a trip actually uh, at Disney World and uh, got a phone call basically asking if um, my dad and my brother would accompany her back to Stutthof to be part of a uh, news program. It was a news magazine program called the Crusaders, uh, which was kind of like Dateline. Uh, it's not around anymore. Um, and this was around the time that Schindler's List had just been released in theaters. Um, and there had been a reaction of some students at a school somewhere who had been shown Schindler's List and actually had a, a not the right response to it. They had, they had laughed and made some, some you know, poor comments uh, in response to the film. And there was a, a decision made that they, someone should make some uh, video um, to use as curriculum in schools um, of a survivor um, to help contextualize Schindler's List as a real story. Um, and so uh, my grandmother was living in Santa Barbara um, and she was chosen to go. People knew her and knew her story. Um, and when I was 10, my brother and my dad and my grandmother flew to this country, Poland, uh, where Stutthof, the museum, the, is now. And I just remember thinking this, you know, this is the first time I heard, you know, what is Stutthof? Um, and that this place that had this really dark history in my family um, started to be explained to me as a, as a, as a child. Um, and I remember getting a very uh, clear lesson on my grandmother's entire story um, through the experience of this um, film crew that, that brought them back to uh, Stutthof. Um, and so just so everyone's aware, just a few things about uh, her story and, and uh, what happened at Stutthof. Her mother, my great-grandmother, Mina, was murdered in the gas chamber there in 1944. Um, and so these are things I learned about at 10 years old. Um, I don't think I understood all of it. Um, I'm sure it was explained to me in a certain way that a 10-year-old can understand. Um, but I learned at that point, you know, exactly, you know, what it meant to be a survivor, that she had survived the Holocaust. Um, so I do have a video clip that I could show of that trip back to Stutthof, and then I obviously would take some time to explain more about her story. Um, but bear yeah. with me as I, uh, I go through this. They took her. They took her with like 20 other women. And uh, I clung to her and I said, I want to go with you. And she said, no. And I said, yes. And uh, we went into the uh, gas chamber and we're told to get undressed. The guards looked at me and he said, laughing. And I, I know he was drunk because I, the way he was saying, he said, Shh, no, I should run. And uh, he said, ain't sway dry, you know, he started counting. And my mother starts uh, saying, lay feud it. One, one. And I, one. So you ran out of the gas yeah. chamber. Will walking into that place again for the mm -hmm. first time be the hardest thing you've done in a long time? Yeah. What makes you want to go back to that place? To show the world. <laughs>
She shares her pain to show us what happens when bigotry and racism go unchallenged. So, you know, watching, I'm sorry, that's amazing. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about this place that she was, I've actually never heard of this concentration camp. I think a lot of us, you know, Auschwitz, you know, Birkenau, you know, you know, the big ones, right? But can you tell us a little bit about Stutthof? Yeah, to me, Stutthof, you know, you can imagine seeing that when you're 10 or 11. Um, you know, this is a place that became etched in my mind uh, for the rest of my life. Um, uh, and so Stutthof is uh, a concentration camp um, that it was located in Nazi-occupied Poland. Um, you can still go there today. That was a clip from 1994. It's now a museum um, and a memorial. Um, and what's uh, interesting to a lot of people about Stutthof um, is that it had a gas chamber. And a lot of people think of, uh, people know that there are many concentration camps other than Auschwitz and you know the, the death camps that we think of, but uh, what people don't often realize is that uh, systematic murder was part of every concentration camp uh, under the Nazi system. Um, and so uh, just to give a little more context on that clip um, that you saw, so Judy was 15 years old when she was in the camp uh, with her sister Rachel, who um, was just a few years older than her, and their mother Mina. Um, and so uh, you know, the story that she has told um, her whole life and that I've known since I was a kid is that uh, she was ripped from her mother's arms and um, the last day she saw her, her mother was taken into the gas chamber and um, Judy was in line with her uh, during the selection process and a guard ordered her to go back to her barracks. Um, and that was the last that she ever saw of her mother. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's been something that has stuck with me since I was a kid. So speaking of you as a kid, you know, I see this woman on this tape. This is an amazing heroic woman who goes back and confronts these things. And it sounds like speaks about them a lot um, in classes. She's also your, your grandma, right? I mean, how do you sort of, how do you see her in this, in, when you're a younger person? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we always referred to Safta as a survivor. Um, you know, she's, very outspoken. So that um, trauma and that experience that she um, uh, had in her life was very much uh, on the surface uh, to anyone who anyone who's ever met her uh, knows that she's a survivor. As her grandkid, um, you know, we would visit her in Santa Barbara growing up and uh, she would just like to bake cookies with us and um, you know, go swimming in the pool and snuggle on the couch, um, you know, and just, and have a good time. Um, you know, one thing about her is that she had her, her childhood stolen from her. Um, you know, the war, she, she was born in 1929, uh, which is the same year Anne Frank was born, um, you know, and, and it just makes you realize that Anne Frank could be here today uh, to tell us her story. Um, that's how close we are in age. And, you know, we talk about being third generation, you know, we're just so, there are still survivors here to tell us their story and um, nothing can really replace the, their eyewitness um, story. But being born in 1929, her whole childhood was, was the war. Um, when she was 12 years old, uh, the family was imprisoned in the Kovno ghetto um, for a couple of years. Um, there was mass murder there um, from day one. Uh, she was trained, she had blonde hair and blue eyes as a kid. Um, and uh, she was trained actually to um, be able to sneak out of the Kovno ghetto and, and smuggle food back in because um, she didn't necessarily look Jewish to the people on the street. Um, you know, by when she was 14 uh, or 15, they were then uh, deported from the ghetto to Stutthof and her brother Abe was separated from the family um, and was sent to Dachau concentration camp. Um, and then they were in Stutthof for nearly a year. Um, 
which is where her mother was murdered. Um, and she was, uh, they, they eventually were, they escaped. She and her sister escaped Stutthof during a death march, um, had a very harrowing journey across um, war-torn Europe. They ended up being liberated in Denmark um, through an incredible series of events, uh, including being on a boat that was torpedoed and uh, basically drifting to be rescued by another boat and ending up in a displaced persons camp in Denmark where they're liberated. Um, and she was 16 when, she, when the war finally ended. Uh, she and her sister thought they were the only two Jews left on earth uh, the day that, that the Red Cross came forward and asked if there were any Jews uh, in the area and they came forward. Um, so as, a, as her grandkid, uh, you don't realize it, but she was very committed to uh, making sure that her grandkids had happiness in their life. Uh, and I know that that's, she had to come a long way in her adult life to get to the point where she could, um, could appreciate that, I think, and, and to be able to um, see happiness uh, as, a, as a pursuit. Um, and something that could be attainable. Um, I think that her grandkids are the biggest joy that she's ever had in her life. Um, and she really has, uh, she cherishes every second she has with us. Um, and something, sorry to interrupt you, something we talk about so much in the series is like meeting these people, these survivors as grandparents. I, I imagine it was harder for her to, when your parents, when your, your, your parents and your aunt and uncle, you know, it's hard for you to raise a child right after this, but once you, you know, have sort of dealt with a lot of the, the emotional trauma and you have grandchildren, I think that's when what you're saying is true, right? Like you really are able to say like, I want to give this, like, there's just so much less, less baggage there at that time. Is that something you, you found in your experience and your family's experience? Yeah. You know, she continued to speak and tell her story through uh, until she could no longer travel anymore. I mean, um, uh, so all the way up until probably about six or seven years ago, she was still flying across the country to tell her story. Um, you know, she, she really, she's an activist. And um, so we all, we always knew that, that that was, you know, a, that was a very present and important part of her identity uh, is being a survivor and uh, teaching about what that means. And, and, um, gifting us with that story. Um, but she also uh, definitely just wanted her grandkids to be happy and to be able to spend time with us and not have it be, you know, uh, defined by this, this trauma that our family had, had experienced. Um, so, you know, but over the years, I've learned more and more. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, this, you know, you're peeling this onion and when you're 10 years old, the the version of the story that that you are told is is different than the version that that I've learned over the past couple of years. Um, you know, really, uh, really getting into the these trials and and you know what it meant for her to become a a, a, a witness in a trial. Um, you know, the the depth of that story is endless. Um, and so, and, and also her identity or, or my perception of her changes with that, um, you know, being able to understand some of the choices and some of the, the things that she had to confront, uh, throughout her life, telling her own story, uh, is something also that I think I have a better understanding of now than I ever did because I've had to kind of walk a little bit in those shoes more as an adult. So let's talk about that. I mean, when did you become so involved in this story? I mean, when did you, when did this, this sort of journey for you start? So, um, in 2017, uh, the FBI knocked on her door and literally they went to her, uh, the, the apartment building that she lives in, in, in Minneapolis and looked for her. Uh, and apparently this FBI agent sort of realized that might not be the greatest. I, she didn't answer, she didn't answer the knock on the door. And then I think he thought to himself and said, I, maybe I shouldn't just knock on this. Old lady. Bang on the door of this I, woman. Who know, is, yeah. 
so so he he dropped a business card in my dad's uh in my parents uh mailbox uh nearby and um asked for, and and told the front desk at, at Judy's apartment that my dad should call call them so my dad gets a message saying the FBI is looking for your mom um and uh he's like he's you know, we have no idea what this is. So he calls and the FBI explains that um, the German uh, German justice system is looking at indicting uh, former guards from Stutthof um, and that they're looking for eyewitnesses. And because of, um, you know, the way our governments work with Germany, the FBI has to get involved to help them coordinate any kind of deposition or interview. The German, these German investigators can't just show up at Judy's apartment on their own. Because uh, nothing is more terrifying than the <laughs> FBI showing up. Yeah. The only thing is the German police, yeah. Exactly. So um, the question was, would she want to speak to them? Um, would, she, would she want to participate in these trials as an eyewitness? And she's been this, she will tell anyone her story if they're willing to listen. Um, we never thought that she would have an opportunity to give this testimony to German authorities. Um, so the answer is yes, of course she would. Um, and the, a few months later, uh, in June of 2017, a couple of investigators from Germany flew over to Minneapolis and I jumped on a plane from New York um, and uh, joined them in her apartment. Um, I took a picture that day uh, of her waiting for them. Um, and here we are in her apartment waiting for German investigators to uh, come and take her testimony. Um, and it was, it was an incredible day. Uh, they asked her questions for four hours. Um, and these are questions that she is not normally asked. Uh, it was a very specific kind of information that they were looking for. Um, you know, she really wanted to tell them about the Kovno ghetto and about, um, you know, the day that the Nazis marched into Lithuania, where she was born. Um, they really were focused, hyper-focused on Stutthof. Uh, they wanted to know, what does she remember about Stutthof? Does she remember the, the shift changes of the guards? Where were the guards standing? Um, did she remember seeing guards on the guard tower? Could the guards see her from the guard tower? Uh, were the guards the same guards in the morning as they were in the evening? Um, it was, you know, it was a deposition uh, and they were building a case against um, guards at Stutthof to try to prove that standing guard on a watchtower at Stutthof, even if you didn't pull a trigger, um, was, made, was uh, worthy of being charged with accessory to mass murder. Um, and so did she remember this? I mean, and is there an argument she that- She remembered a lot. And it's 2017 at this point. Um, and she, she could still remember a lot. Um, it's amazing that she was able to give it testimony that day because um, just even a few years later um, today, she wouldn't be capable of that. Um, uh, her memory is just faded and, and she's not as, as sharp um, as she was. Uh, so the timing was amazing. Uh, they got so much information from her. Um, but what was really remarkable and no one expected is that she actually identified a photo of one of the guards that they were investigating. And so all of a sudden in the middle of this testimony, um, and it's in the room, it's, it's me and my dad and her, um, and we're trying to kind of help and then there's the two German investigators, and then there's two FBI agents. And there's a lot of translation going on because some of the questions had been written in German or for them to ask. So they had to sort of translate them to English and then she answered in English and then they had to translate it back to German and type it down and then read it back to her and make sure that they got the answer right. It was, it was a, a, a difficult four hours of questioning um, that she went through. Uh, but at one point, they uh, slide this photo across the table of a guard uh, from Stutthof. And she sits back in her chair and looks like she's seen a ghost. I mean, her eye, like, goes, she's pale. And she starts uh, saying, um, that's Mela, Mela. And she, she starts naming him. 
Um, and, and so the room, everything kind of comes to a halt. Uh, and all of a sudden they start really focusing on this guard um, and asking her, what does she remember about him? And um, she had some, a few somewhat vague, but interesting details uh, that were, um, that they were really interested in. Um, and it, this is the guard that ended up on trial a year later. Um, now, her identifying him was really not necessary for them to indict him, um, but it was, it made the, uh, the trial uh, for our family, I think, take on a, another level of sort of intensity to um, just having watched her uh, have that response to him in the room um, was really kind of uh, shocking and, and uh, really an interesting kind of moment. Um, it, it seems like it would have been harder for her to do that testimony to make that identification had she not spent most of her life telling this story over and over again had she had she sort of suppressed it and never talked about it like do, do you see a connection between those things how she sort of approached the rest of her life versus her you know with her ability to to be helpful in this in this circumstance yeah i think that um it's an interesting thing to think about for sure i mean um, it was challenging for her in that deposition, I think, to, to focus on their questions uh, versus wanting to tell her story the way that she normally tells it to an audience about, you know, or, which she's teaching. Um, and, uh, and so, um, but, but it was, it was a fascinating uh, thing. I mean, there were things that came out in that, wa watching her give testimony to them was very different than watching her uh, speak to a, a classroom. Um, you know, she had drawn some diagrams of, of Studhoff, um, and, uh, you know, she was, she even drew the, um, the front gate of Studhoff, um, you know, which I have a photo of also that, that, um, you know, she was able to kind of draw this gate, uh, and this, this unique shape, um, of the, of the stairs. And they called this the death gate. This is this was the front gate of Schuhoff. Um, and the guards would stand on this on this tower. And this was really kind of like one of the primary uh, guard towers that that really had a view of the whole camp and was guarding the entrance of, of and the exit of the camp. Um, and so uh, she they had also given her a lot of the questions um, in advance so that she could also, you know, I think she had she had not slept much the night before. Uh, trying to trying to remember as much as she could. Um, after they left, uh, the next part of this this trial process was a, there was a lot of waiting. Uh, we waited uh, about a year for an indictment to be uh, brought forward, um, and then this former guard is at the time was ninety five or ninety six years old, and uh, he they had to go through a lot of processes to see if he was even healthy enough to stand trial. Um, meanwhile, we had come to the decision with her that, that she would not travel to be at the trial in person. Um, you know, she, she at this point was uh, 90 years old, turning 90, and um, just wasn't, it, it wasn't gonna be possible for her to travel across the, across the globe to be in Germany. Um, and that's when I decided that uh, someone from our family should be there. And um, so I was in a position uh, with where I, with things in my life that I decided I would go. Um, and you were like, I missed the trip the last time. What's that? Like, yeah, I exactly. I was too time. young to go in 1994. And uh, here was, here was a chance to, um, to, to take on that, that role in our family and, and be there to bear witness at the trial. Um, and so I started making arrangements uh, to be at, the, at that first trial. And uh, it was really complicated. Um, I'd never been to Germany before. I really had never traveled by myself before. Um, although as a filmmaker, I decided I wanted to start making a film about this journey that I was gonna go on. Um, and so I did bring with me uh, a couple of people to help me uh, film and, and document as much as I could. I really felt strongly that uh, something I could do to sort of empower myself a little bit in this very scary and kind of, uh, uh, you know, intense situation um, on, 
very, I, I just felt like I wanted to have my camera with me um, and to be able to, to be able to tell this story uh, and share that story of, of being on that front line, front, front row seat, uh, watching justice uh, unfold, hopefully, uh, was something that I, I decided I wanted to um, pursue. And uh, so yeah, so about a year after that, uh, that a year after she gave testimony, I, I flew to Germany for the first time um, and, uh, and attended that first trial. So, okay, let's just step back. So you go to Germany, but the, because the trial's in Germany, but the camp was in Poland. Correct. And someone's actually asking where, where in Poland the camp was and actually how you spell the name of the camp. Again, right. a camp we have not heard of, which is just so fascinating about this yeah. story. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll just say one of the things that's important to, about these trials, um, you know, the, the lawyers or, or Nazi hunters, as, as you can call them, that's what these, these uh, professional uh, legal professionals are who are pursuing these trials. Um, they were particularly interested in focusing on Studhoff uh, in this most recent round of trials in Germany, specifically to illustrate that um, there were gas chambers at camps uh, that people don't necessarily associate with being a death camp. Um, that's, that systematic murder was part of those camps. So Stutthof is spelled S-T-U-T-T-H-O-F. Uh, um, and uh, it's, uh, the, the museum is located in like very north, northern Poland. Uh, so um, near, I think the, that's the Baltic Sea, I believe, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so get to Germany, like what, what happens? So I arrived in Germany and um, what, was, what was really interesting, I was very nervous to land in Germany. Um, uh, I certainly have not associated Germany with ple a pleasant history for my family. Um, and uh, I, I land in Germany, I fly into Frankfurt and um, a journalist named Per Heinrichs, who's been a sort of a guiding angel uh, for me in this entire process. Um, he's a German reporter um, who had prior to uh, the trial reached out and actually came to Minneapolis to meet Judy and interview her. And when I landed in Germany on every newsstand was a uh, Newspaper was one of the most one of the largest newspapers in Germany. I felt uh, he had done a full page story about her, and her picture was basically on on every newsstand uh, at the airport when I landed in Germany. And welcoming you there. Yeah, it it was it was so bizarre. Uh, this whole trip was I, the only way to describe it was bizarre. It, at, at, you know, at most of the time, um, it's really hard to describe the feeling of of being there. Um, to attend this trial, but um, but I landed there, and and from the minute I was I, I got there, you know, every German I met was so extremely kind to me, um, and was so interested in in the fact of, of, as to why I was in Germany, um, and most of the people, most of the Germans that I inter interacted with throughout the throughout my I was there for about ten days. I, I attended the first two days of the trial because um, they only meet the trials would only hold session two days a week. Um, and uh, most of the people that I interacted with were either courtroom, court uh, staff of, uh, running the courtroom, the security guards and, and the lawyers, but then a lot of journalists, uh, a lot of German journalists who really became uh, kind of really good allies for me as I was navigating, uh, you know, the streets of Germany and uh, navigating this really complicated uh, judicial process as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I got to Germany and, and, uh, the first day I attended court, um, and saw Johan Rebogen, who's the guard, uh, on trial, uh, in court was, was really, uh, was really an intense day. I mean, I, here I am standing in, in, a uh, courtroom, um, standing opposite, uh, this this man who once stood on a guard tower over my family um, 75 years earlier it was it was really surreal 
Um, but you, an actual you, Nazi, like you were in the room with an actual Nazi. A real life Nazi, yeah. I mean, it's, um, but he just, he's an old, old man uh, who doesn't look like he could hurt, hurt a fly. Um, and he, you know, he's cut, wheeled in in a wheelchair, um, you know, is uh, just really looks like he belongs in bed, really. Uh, he was not in great health. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really hard to, at first, look at him and, and you, you have a, it's natural to have a, a sense of um, sympathy for this old man on trial at first. Uh, but then you think about what happened uh, and, and you, you have to try to picture him as a young man standing on a guard tower. Um, and for me, I have, I have endless pictures in my head of my grandmother re-entering the gas chamber in 1994 and weeping. Uh, and, you know, these photos of, of my great grandmother who I, I never got to meet, but I could have potentially met if, if she hadn't been murdered. Um, you know, just these painful, painful stories that are so personal. That's enough, let alone, you know, thinking about the mass murder that had happened there. So pretty quickly that sim any sympathy that, that, you know, one feels uh, for him in the room, at least for me, it, that, that sympathy uh, is pushed aside. Um, but it still, you know, raises so many complicated questions um, about why are we here today? You know, why, why did this take so long? Um, why, what's the point of sitting in this, in this courtroom 75 years later? What, what possible justice could be served um, to this man? And um, I see somebody just asked if he had any remorse. Um, and uh, he, on the second day of the trial, they read a statement from him. Um, and, uh, or, and, and the statement was really kind of very off-putting. Um, he talked about how um, terrible the conditions were in the camp. He acknowledged that, um, you know, that, that there was a gas chamber. He acknowledged that there was, there was starving, you know, people were starving daily. P bodies were piling higher every day. So he talked about that, but then he also said that uh, it was his own personal health is the way he described it. That for him, uh, he, he, it was hell. And it's like, at that point, you kind of go, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, like, and, and he made a statement, his defense, by the way, was that he uh, was forced to be there, that he had been drafted, and that he couldn't get away. Um, well, the investigators um, pr can prove, and this is known, that um, he was not drafted. He was actually a volunteer uh, member of the SS. So, um, you know, really had, had, had no, I had no sympathy for Johann Rebogen. And um, it was, it was a really uncomfortable and, uh, and, and difficult thing to have to listen to his, his statements and him asking for, uh, for sympathy. And also, um, you know, I, I, I don't think he really, if he asked for any forgiveness, it, it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was even necessarily genuine and, um, or, or it wasn't like he was necessarily felt like he was personally account. He didn't take any personal responsibility for anything that he did. It's um, funny to think about like a Nazi guard saying how hard it must have been for them in a concentration camp. It's like, like it's, it makes you stun. It really does kind of make you sick um, to have to listen to it. Um, so what happens with this, with this case? So, um, so it's, so with this case, um, I flew back to, to Brooklyn, um, and, uh, after the first two, first couple weeks of the trial, um, and in week, I believe it was around week three, uh, just another one or two weeks after I left, um, the, uh, prosecution began presenting this evidence about how Johann Rebogen had been a volunteer in the SS, which was like the, the, the primary defense, line of defense that he had, he had brought forth. They were just blowing it up in court. And basically at that moment, he collapsed in the courtroom. And uh, 
they had to end the court session that day um, and he never returned. Um, I actually don't know if he's still alive today, uh, but my understanding is for at least another year, he, he basically lived, has lived the rest of his days um, or lived the rest of his days in, uh, you know, at home in bed uh, without a verdict. So that trial ended uh, very abruptly. Um, we were warned from the beginning that these trials started taking place, that, that, that that's, there's a high likelihood of that. I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, the, the, what were the youngest of the perpetrators of the Holocaust who are now, you know, in their late 90s um, or mid or early to late 90s. Um, and uh, we, the fact that a trial even started was something that we were warned, don't, don't get your hopes up for a trial at any point. Um, so yeah, the trial was thrown out, no verdict um, for Johan Rebogen, and, and we all kind of returned to, to normal life. Uh, you know, to be honest, as much as we talked about what happened to our family my whole life, the idea of a trial had never come up in conversation. Uh, nobody had sought this out in our family. Judy certainly had never said, oh, I just, if only someone would have, be held accountable in, in court. Um, it really wasn't ever on our radar that this was, that there was any possibility of this. Um, and, uh, and so we returned to normal. We kind of returned to this, you know, we had this kind of crazy year or so of like waiting for the trial and then it just ended abruptly and um, I began speaking. Um, I, I was invited to speak at some really interesting places and the National Security Agency brought me to Fort Meade to speak at their ho annual Holocaust Remembrance event. And I, I uh, somewhere in a deep, deep archive in there, uh, you know, under lock and key is, is my presentation to the entire NSA uh, network um, in, in which I told Judy's story and I told the story about attending that trial. Um, and uh, yeah, I just began doing a lot of thinking and some writing and, and continued to develop this idea of a film um, as to how, to how can I tell her story and this chapter of late justice um, and things like that. But, but really, you know, it felt like that was it felt like there was sort of uh, never going to be a verdict. And, and, and we were told that was it. There, there were no other, there were, even though there were other guards that were under investigation, no one, uh, no one made us think that, that another guard would, would ever be indicted. And then there's told, another, and then, yeah. Knock on the door. <laughs> basically, um, another, you know, a year later, uh, um, I found myself back in Germany attending another trial. Uh, of a man named Bruno Dai. And um, Bruno Dai was also a guard at Stutthof. It was the same premise. Um, Judy was again uh, listed as a wit, you know, her testimony that she was able to give in 2017 was included in the indictment of the guards. So the text of that entire um, indict, uh, that entire deposition is part of the, uh, is part of the indictment. Um, so we get a phone call from her lawyer in Germany and he says, would she want to do this again? Um, you know, she, she just has to sign the paper and she'll be listed as a witness and as a co-plaintiff. And, um, of course she says yes. And, uh, she signed the papers and I flew back to Germany, uh, this time to Hamburg. Um, the previous trial was in a small town called Munster, Germany. Um, and they hold these trials in whatever the jurisdiction is where the, where the former guard lives now. Uh, that's where the trial, that's where the trials held. And really interestingly, the trials are in juvenile court. Because um, they were so young when it happened? Because they were under, they were juveniles when they, when it happened. So could they end up going to like juvenile detention? Theoretically, I don't really understand, honestly, the, the legal, pr I barely understand the American justice system, let alone having to learn the nuances of the German justice system. But, um, but yes, the, the, they are viewed as a juvenile in the courtroom, even though they're in their 90s. Um, now, everyone will tell you, the experts will tell you when you go, when these trials happen that 
no one is going to ask for or expect jail time. Uh, the, per the, the plan here is not to lock these guys up. Um, that would be different if they were considered, you know, true mass murderers. Um, of, you know, that, that would maybe be a different story. But these, the, the charges are accessory to mass murder. And the framework of it is really, um, the, the shame of it is that had Germany pursued these trials, uh, you know, s sooner uh, when they were younger, the, the, the punishment is several years in jail. I, you know, it might be a decade or, or something like that. Um, and then the idea is these men would be allowed to re-enter society. Um, well, when you're 96 and you're facing potentially 10 years in jail, we're talking about a death sentence. Um, so it's, it's this delay in justice is not only unfair to the victims and the survivors who have had to wait so long, but it's also actually unfair to the perpetrator, to the person on trial as well, because the punishment is so twisted at this point. It doesn't, there's, there's no punishment you can really come up with that actually like makes any sense anymore. Well, then the question is why the why are these trials happening? And so I guess could you could you bring us up to speed? What's happening in this second trial? Where sure. where where do things stand now? Yeah. So um, this was also just an unbelievable thing to watch. Um, again, I attended the first couple weeks of the of the trial. I unfortunately couldn't move to Germany for a year to to be there every day, and um, it was fast. It was fascinating. Um, you know, Bruno Dai, unlike Johan Verbogen is actually much, was much healthier, uh, much more capable of speaking for himself. You know, J Johan Verbogen, the first guard on trial, everything that he would, uh, every statement he would give would be read by his lawyer. Um, so he really, you never really actually heard him speak um, directly. Bruno Dai, from what I was told, he wanted to have a trial. That was the exact quote that, our, that the lawyers uh, said to me, is that he actually wants, he feels like he's innocent and he wants a chance to like explain why he thinks he's innocent in court, essentially. So what was his argument? So similarly, what the, what the, common, argu the common argument you hear from, from these former guards is that they, were, they had no choice, that they were following orders. Um, and that's essentially what his, what his argument uh, boiled down to. And um, I was terrified. I was terrified that this court would agree with him. Um, you know, there have been other trials. There have been uh, many trials over the last decade. These are, this, is, this is a continuation of a new effort by Germany over the last um, 10 to 15 years to, um, to sort of finish out uh, a, a process of justice that was, that was kind of left on the table for a long time. Um, you know, they started with the Nuremberg trials and uh, really went after the top brass. Um, they later, over the decades, have held some trials for, um, you know, other mass, other people who could be proven to have been mass murderers, uh, murderers in, in, the, in the camps um, and elsewhere. But what they had never really done until just over a decade ago is really look at um, the uh, accessory to mass murder as its own charge. Um, could you hold someone accountable just for being a guard in a camp? Um, they didn't have to fire a weapon. You didn't have to prove that they were responsible for a single murder in itself. Just the duty of the guard being um, all that mattered. And so um, you can, you know, a lot of people have heard of John Dignana, uh, who was kind of the first um, guards in Germany to be to be found guilty uh, of this um, accessory to mass murder um, that was uh, just in in the late 2000s um, and since then once they had once they had won once they had had, had that precedent uh, they've continued to pursue charges of others um, but they they've been selective I think in some of in the way they've done it I mentioned earlier that they're really interested in guards from Stutthof right now, partly because they they know where they are and they they have the list of them. Um, but Stutthof, in, as as an example of another kind of camp, um, so that the focus is not just on Auschwitz, um, but they really want to put in the record books um, and acknowledge that Stutthof was a place of mass murder. Um, so you asked where where are things at today? So um, Bruno Dai. Uh, 
gave his, when I, when I attended the opening of, of the trial Bruno died, that was the first time I actually heard a real life Nazi speak. Um, Johann Rebogen sort of sat in his chair and his lawyer read a statement for him. Um, Bruno Dai came in and, and again, was, you know, brought in in a wheelchair. Um, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of theater to what goes on in these courtrooms and, and especially with these guards. They, they'll do anything they can to garner as much sympathy as possible. Um, and he, uh, he spoke and he was very um, adamant that he was innocent. Um, just to kind of fast forward a little bit, uh, the pandemic hit, you know, the, the trial started in November of 2019. Uh, so just a year ago, I was about, I was packing my bags uh, to go to Germany. Um, by February or March, Germany was uh, shut down and the trial was put on a brief pause. And in Germany, there's this very um, strict rule that if the trial doesn't meet, in like within a consecutive amount of days, then it has to start over from the beginning. And I was sure that the pandemic was going to be the end of this trial. Um, I was like, there's no way they're going to, he, he immediately asked for the trial to be thrown out. The, the defense immediately said, we, this is unsafe. We can't have a trial, of course. And I thought, of course the judge is going to. Yeah, Nazis always say that. Yeah. And, and so, um, but the judge stuck with it. The judge was amazing. She said, no, we are going to continue meeting uh, every three weeks. And they did these, I think what they did is they would have these like brief sessions just to like stay with this, within this rule that it had to be consecutive. Uh, but if you look at photos, if you, if you look at uh, articles about this trial, towards the end of the trial, everyone's in full PPE and, um, you know, uh, in the courtroom. It's really bizarre. Um, but amazingly, uh, in July, um, they found him guilty. And wow. up until that day, I was sure that this thing was going to either never have a verdict or even worse, that they would find him innocent. Um, and uh, I had always hoped to be at the trial. I'd always planned to be there for the verdict. But again, because of uh, the pandemic, there was no way I was flying to Germany, um, nor would I think they would even let me uh, if I wanted to. Um, and so uh, instead I drove uh, with my wife uh, from New York to Minneapolis and was able to be with Judy to tell her uh, the news uh, the day that we, I was with her the day that we learned the verdict. And that was much more special than being in the courtroom. Uh, it, 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 I would much, I'm, I'm so glad and grateful that I got to be with her uh, to, to tell her that, that all that effort that, that everyone had put in to have these trials um, and that her, her effort to share her story had also contributed to some form of late justice. And so, so how did she feel getting that verdict? And then also a question that's coming in, um, was, was she able to sort of watch any of this by Skype or was she able to sort of, how, how did she sort of keep track of, of the, the, um, the courtroom? Yeah, you know, um, her hearing's not great and she's not the most technical, technologically uh, savvy um, person. We, we have done weekly Zooms with her as a family uh, lately, but um, at the time, during the trial, that was, there's no way. Um, but we really just relied heavily on the journalists that we, that I had made relationships with and also the lawyer who was representing her in the courtroom um, and the other lawyers as well. We, we would get updates. Um, so we kind of get a little bit like a insider update directly from the courtroom since she was participating. Um, we had access to that, to sort of a real, somewhat of a real time uh, update. Um, and then, but sometimes we'd actually learn things from journalists first too. I mean, it was kind of a, a, a mishmash of, you know, trying to just keep eyes on, on what's going on in Germany. In the international news, these things are usually covered when they start and when they end. Um, there's not a lot of, and especially with the news cycle today, there's very little coverage of these things um, when they, especially the ongoing. Within Germany, there's more interest. If you, you know, so I, I got really savvy at, uh, at, you know, using, you know, Google Translate and all kinds, you know, I, I like have subscriptions to German newspapers. I don't even, I don't speak German at all. Um, but I, I really have tried to keep really close, um, close watch on what's going on. We would share that with her. But she also, to be honest, she really wasn't interested in like the day to day. I mean, I have to just say that it's like um, I became obsessed with this, and my dad became obsessed with this. Um, 
um, you know, and, and uh, we were really fascinated by it. She just wanted to care for her orchids. Uh, and she wanted to know that I was happy and when am I getting married and uh, what, you know, when am I, you know, gonna, you know, get a, get a better paying job. And, you know, she, she really just wants to know what's going on with me. She really um, wasn't as, uh, you know, focused on this trial at all. So, you know, I sort of want to talk to you. You described going to Germany um, and feeling you were almost protected by your camera, right? You were able to do this thing that, that you do professionally and to sort of put the lens quite literally on your own family story. I mean, we have a few people asking um, how they can see what it is, all the film that you've done. Um, so, so what are you working on? And, and I guess, why? Like, why are you so, I, I, I understand, right? Like this, this, com this, this compelling nature of the story, but you know, it seems like you've actually devoted a good amount of your professional life to, to these trials. I mean, you didn't, I don't think the expectation was ever that you should be going to Germany by anyone in your family. I mean, why did you take this on and, and, and what are you working on? So, you know, the, the classic answer I give, and it's, it's true, is that, you know, she, Judy will tell, Judy, a part of her story that she talks about um, with great conviction is that when she was in the barrack uh, at Stutthof, um, she and some other women uh, together made a promise to each other that they would, it, that if any of them survived, they knew that, you know, they, they were watching their family and, and other uh, fellow prisoners dying every day. They made a promise to each other that if any of them survived, that they would tell the story of what happened. And that's what drove her to tell this story um, afterwards. She always pointed to that promise that she made. Um, and so growing up, that was something that I was taught is that she had made this promise, um, that she, um, that she has this obligation, uh, and duty to make sure with, that, that we say, never forget. Um, and when I saw that she could no longer tell her story or go to the trials, I, I realized that somebody needed to take that to, that that promise was something that, that I wanted to make sure she saw was going to be kept uh, by our family. Um, so that was a big motivator for me, was this sense of duty to her uh, and that promise. Um, but beyond that, this, this trial and the experiences that I've had learning about uh, our history and um, coming to this realization that her story is my story, and in my case, I think that's really heightened, obviously, by the fact that I stood in this courtroom with this man who stood on the watchtower standing over my family. That there's this like direct line uh, between her experience and my experience. It's not just a story that I was told. It's something that I actually, it, it, it's truly like changed my, the course of my life. Um, and I can feel that in like really specific ways, but it, it but anyone whose grand whose grandparents were uh, impacted by this um, should be able to say the same thing. They just might not be able to see it the way I've seen it. Um, and so it's caused me to reflect and to um, really think about so many different um, things going on in our world today. Um, and as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, you know, I'm often working on, you know, I, I work on other people's films. I, I'm an editor, I, I tell story, I help other people tell stories. Um, and, you know, I'm very sensitive to whose stories I'm telling or, or helping tell. Um, and because of that, I think I'm also really uh, feel um, empowered when I have the chance to tell my own story. Um, and I think it's important to let people tell their own stories. I often say there's no replacing an eyewitness um, so I always try to include Judy's words in, in what I'm doing as well, um, because there are pieces of this that I'll never be able to tell her story the way she can tell it. Um, but I can certainly hopefully use my experiences to help teach and to, to give some understanding of what, what happened. And I think you have another clip from Judy, right? That you might I do. See. Yeah. I'd love to share this. I just found this yesterday, actually. Um, and this is, uh, so she, when she moved to Santa Barbara, um, she opened a school um, 
and uh, she became an early child. She was an early childhood educator, which I think is so amazing when you think about her not having uh, a childhood. Um, she dedicated her whole life to kids and to um, spending her time with kids. That was she loved nothing more than uh, being with the really young kids and teaching them. And um, so I found this clip. She was on the news in Santa Barbara. Um, and I'm assuming, you know, she was probably interviewed. I'm guessing it was uh, Holocaust Remembrance time or maybe the anniversary of Kristallnacht, who knows. They were doing a story on a survivor. Um, and she, in this clip, does such an amazing job, I think, of, of explaining what motivated her um, to, uh, to tell her story. So I'd love to just share it. Um, let me get that queued up. And this recording to everyone asking will be available, the recording of tonight's event, um, as well as any information that Ben can share that'll all get emailed out tomorrow um, from the museum of his work and everything like that. So here we go. There is nothing as important as being caring for another human being and giving that opportunity to the every person who wants to be different and respect the differences. Respecting the differences of others while enjoying one's own individuality is what Judy teaches in the preschool she established. It's located in a Santa Barbara synagogue, but is open to children of all faiths. There is a three-year waiting list for children wanting to get in. We're not all the same color. We don't eat the same food. We don't pray this, all the same. And that's just something that is very important to me. This woman, who has seen so much in her life, says she can deal with hate, but not with apathy. Judy says we must speak out against injustice and be willing to take action to prevent history from repeating itself. We have to be really constantly on the guard to see what politicians promise us. Do they promise us false hopes and we are so gullible to accept it? And she says we must care for one another to help those in need and be willing to get involved. You have to care, you have to care for the homeless, you have to care for the people who don't have what you have. In Santa Barbara, Willa Sandmeyer, Key News. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Um, ben Cohen, thank you for sharing this story, your story, Judy's story, and thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you so much. Uh, ben, I want to echo Stephanie's thanks. That was the clip was beautiful, and the conversation was was beautiful to watch. Thanks for sharing some of your family story and your insights from the courtroom. Uh, and thank you to Stephanie, our ever gracious interviewer and host of the Generally Speaking series. To everyone watching, we will, as Stephanie mentioned, send out a recording of the program tomorrow, and it'll be available on the Museum of Jewish Heritage YouTube channel. If you found tonight meaningful, I hope you will consider making a donation to the museum or becoming a member because all of our programming relies upon the generosity of community members like you. I hope you also check out Tablet Magazine's podcast, Unorthodox, for more interviews by Stephanie and her co-hosts with interesting Jews from all walks of life. And I'm dropping the link to that in the chat now. Um, our next program at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which you can find on our website, is this Sunday evening at 7 p.m. It's a concert with Grammy winner Frank London and his Klezmer Brass All-Stars broadcast live from the museum's Edmund J. Saffer Hall. It's actually our first in the building event since March. So <laughs> it's an exciting occasion and it's, we won't have an in-person audience, but it will be broadcast, broadcast live uh, as a concert. So I hope you'll join. You can find all that information at mjhnyc.org. Um, ben, thank you for being here and good luck with all of your important work to share this story with the world. And Stephanie, thank you and good night. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to the museum for having me. It's really amazing to, to be able to share. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Have a good evening, everyone.